welcome to the Registered Report. My name is John Buckley. I'm the Register of Deeds of Plymouth County. This show is about Plymouth County real estate. Our headline for the month was Sales in Mortgages Remains Strong in August. While the tape show is being taped in September, we're reporting on the August recording numbers at the Registry of Deeds. I also have a great guest in the second segment, Brian McCowan of Northeastern Savings Bank, will be discussing the current status of commercial real estate and the impact upon it of the COVID-19 experience we've been going through. And last but not least in the third segment, we'll be talking about our county notable land records as well as one of our um, colony records, the Plymouth Colony records. So let's go to the numbers. So in August, we had a nice uh, number of sales. Um, so 1,097 deeds were recorded in August, more than the 1064 in July. However, 5% less than last year. Uh, we're about 9% lower for the first eight months in calendar year 2020, but it's the highest number of recordings in 2020. And the average sale price went up 3% from last month. And as anyone who knows that's followed real estate, our sales prices have continued to go, on, go up. Uh, the next image you're going to see is a listing of all 27 communities in Plymouth County and the sales for each community from Abington down to Whitman. And um, you can see there's activity in every community in every month. Um, mortgages are, are the big story of the month. Once again, we hit the highest level of mortgages in 10 years. We've said that now for three months in a row. Uh, the number of mortgages recorded uh, were 3,112, up from 3,079 in July. Um, up 39% compared to last August. And through eight months in the calendar year, the number of mortgages recorded is up 51%. Everyone has refinanced, is looking to finance, refinance. If you're not one of those people, uh, talk to your uh, bank, talk to your lender, and take a look at what you can save. Many people are saving in their payments or shortening the amount, amount of monthly payments uh, for an earlier payoff. Uh, the rates are incredibly low, historically low, so don't miss your opportunity. Although I do think they're going to stay low uh, for some period of time. Uh, next you're going to see is foreclosure deed uh, graphic. Uh, we've always followed the foreclosure issue very closely since the meltdown in 2008. Uh, but because there is a foreclosure moratorium, our numbers are very, very low. There are only eight foreclosure deeds uh, in August, less than the 23 in July, 76% less than last August, and 32% lower than last time, than last year at this time. Uh, however, um, if you are, if you know you're not able to pay your mortgage, and um, that moratorium is going to come to an end, so reach out to your lender and look at your opportunities. In some cases, you'll be able to take what you owe and put it at the back of your loan. Foreclosure notices um, are also extremely low, zero for August. And you'll see a listing of foreclosures by community. Again, a lot of zeros because of the moratorium. Um, we've had a huge number of increase of recordings over the internet. Because of COVID, our training room is closed. Um, again, if you're in trouble paying your mortgage, there are, for, there are COVID impacted forbearances 
that you might be able to work out with your lender. In the next segment of the show, I have a great guest coming, Brian McCowan of Northeastern Savings Bank, who will be discussing the current status of commercial real estate market. See you in the next segment. So welcome back to the Registers Report. My name is John Buckley. I'm the Register of Deeds of Plymouth County. In this segment, we always try to do something informational and educational for the public. And we always have had someone involved in the real estate community. We've had a lot of realtors. We've had a lot of uh, assessors, appraisers, um, land surveyors, um, a lot of uh, residential lenders. And I have a great guest today who's a commercial lender, uh, Brian McCowan of Northeastern Savings Bank. Yeah. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, John. I I'll appreciate shake your it. Shake hand, but we can't do that. <laughs> That's anymore. right. We're keeping our distance yeah. these days. So, so why um, don't you just tell me the story and through me, our viewers, yeah. a little bit about yourself and how you got into the real estate community? Of course. Um, so it all started when I was a public accountant at Wolf and Company in Boston. Um, I really focused on financial institutions in the area. Um, and one of the things that I specialized in was reviewing loan portfolios, reviewing the risk, and really understanding where the banks uh, were exposed in terms of their loan portfolio. Um, I had the chance to meet with Stephen Pike on several occasions, um, and he kind of looked at me and said, you're, you're not the accounting type. And I agreed with him, and at that point, uh, we agreed that we would kind of come up with a solution for me to come over to the bank and manage the commercial loan portfolio. Um, so through that, I got to experience a lot of the different um, types of loans that the bank did. We expanded our portfolio and doing a little bit more in subdivision lending as well as increasing our commercial portfolio. Um, and then with the recent merger uh, with Mutual Bank and becoming the combined Northeastern Savings Bank, um, I had the opportunity to move back um, into getting further involved with the commercial lending area and becoming the commercial loan officer in our Plymouth location, uh, which brings me a little bit closer to home in Kingston, where I'm not traveling from Kingston to Easton anymore. It's now, I have a five mile commute and I'm in an area that I think the bank is really looking to grow with the Plymouth market. So in your bank combined with Mutual Bank, yeah. you obviously expanded the number of locations of the bank? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So we went from nine branches on both sides to now 18 branches that stretch from North Attleboro all the way to Plymouth. So mm -hmm. we operate in Bristol County and Plymouth County. Yeah. And the two banks combined into be a billion dollar bank um, to really be a strong presence in this community and an option to continue to give back at a much larger level um, to the communities that we serve. So pretty good coverage for Southeast MS, you know? Yeah, we have a pretty good coverage, especially um, with the 18 branches as well as additional ATMs that go up to Hanover and down to Raynham sure. uh, with branches in between. So it's been a great combination of two strong banks that um, really have come together to make a stronger bank. Right. Um, so the one thing that, you know, me moving down to Plymouth is that Plymouth is on a little bit on the out outside of what our normal area is in terms of when we look at mm -hmm. our, how far we stretch. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I'm looking really forward to do is to grow our presence in Plymouth and you know build that connection and have more of a, a share of Plymouth and see what we can do to help Plymouth grow and, and give back to the community. Well, it's a pretty big region. Yes, of, it of is. Itself, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Plymouth itself is the largest town in Massachusetts. Sometimes I end up on things down in South Plymouth or West Plymouth and just coming across Plymouth is like going across four or five towns in the middle of the county. And, and that's one of the things I love about Plymouth too is because you can get all the way you know, down towards the canal where you have right. much more of um, the rural area and you have very different businesses down there versus what you see and right downtown in terms right. of multifamilies and other businesses right. that we have in the, t in the town. So how has business been this year? And, and clearly we all had a pretty strong impact in March. Yes, we had a, a very interesting year. I, I think the first couple months, everything was, everyone was doing great and we were really taking off in terms of what we were doing for production. 
Um, COVID obviously hit and the bank itself, we really shut down our regular lending and put all our energy towards the PPP loan financing. Because um, mm -hmm. one of the things that we strive to do as a bank is to be there as a resource to our customers and make sure that we're available to them in order to get the financing that they need. And when COVID hit, what people needed more than anything was that assistance and that ability to get into the PPP funding program. So that's a switch of uh, product? It was definitely a switch, yeah. It was something that, you know, we knew what our priorities were mm -hmm. and what had to be done because mm -hmm. it was something that everybody in the community was feeling. Whether you owned a business or you worked for someone, um, you were impacted by the COVID shutdown. So we did whatever we could to make sure that we were able to get the PPP, fu the PPP funds that were needed. Um, and we're happy to report that everyone that came to us that applied, we were able to get a PPP loan for. Right. Um, I think that was something that we started with our customers first, and then we really reached out to those people in the community that were having tough times in terms of getting PPP loans. So mm -hmm. we took that opportunity to also kind of introdu introduce ourselves to the different people in the community that may have been dealing with a bigger bank that needed that personal touch that you know we have at a billion dollar size bank. Yeah. Um, and really being there for the community. COVID's changed a lot of business opportunities and a lot of businesses, period. You know? That's correct. And, and I think it's important that, you know, we take this opportunity to, to look in terms of what everybody's doing, um, especially now as we're, we're getting back to opening up slowly mm -hmm. um, and trying to figure out what that next step is. So I know forgiveness is getting started. There's different regulations that are going on, but um, we're looking to see what best we can do to make sure that all those PPP loans that we gave are fully forgiven and that people are able to use that money mm -hmm. towards the purpose that it was required for. So how have commercial projects been going during this time period? Yeah, thankfully we, we've had a lot of projects that were well run and you know have a lot of basis to them that you know were able to kind of weather the storm. We've had some um, people who hit a couple snags along the way, which is to be expected. Um, and, you know, we're, we're there to help support them. And so there's been several ways that we've been able to try to assist them, whether it's in a deferral or kind of working with them to figure out how best we can make sure that they can succeed through this time and then work towards what we need to do to secure the financing going forward as well. Yeah, many uh, commercial projects probably were, were stopped by order, right? Yeah, a lot of a lot of construction was stopped entirely. Mm -hmm. So you had it in the state um, statewide kind of ordinance that mm -hmm. there was no more work to be done. So a lot of stuff did get delayed. There was um, thankfully some of those projects that was later in the game in terms of what the state was doing in terms of shutdowns and some of the earlier stuff to restart. So in phase one, that was something that was able to get picked up. So the construction projects um, were ones that had kind of a limited impact in terms of being shut down. When you look at the current scheme, much bigger impact when looking at the total product in terms of timelines and making mm -hmm. sure that, you know, carrying costs during that period, similar to other um, business owners that, you know, have regular mortgages that had that shutdown period. So if I remember, they, they gave some extension to permits and things like that along the way. Yep. So the, anything that was in current permitting had the ability to kind of have that leeway as well to mm -hmm. kind of take that time to get everything figured out. Um, and the same thing with the bank. We were there to work with those that um, had those opportunities and really see what we could do to help them to have as little impact as possible in terms of the shutdown. I know in our case, you know, from mid-March for a few months, we were kind of split off-site, on-site. Um, a lot of offsite, and then it kind of gradually got to the point that, like as we are now, we're not open to the public, but we do have everyone back at work in in our building. Uh, and so I know there's been some modifications along the way that would affect construction and projects. Has it gotten better since that period? It, it's certainly gotten better, and I think the 
getting people back into the businesses has certainly helped in terms mm -hmm. of moving everything forward and getting people back to work has been helpful. Um, I think where we were in a work environment back in March and where we are now is still yeah, right. very different. Right. Um, and that's where communication with those that you look up to or advisors is even more important now. Mm -hmm. And I think the bank prides themselves on being that resource um, and being available to people that you know, need to talk out what needs to be done and how they get to that next step and um, how they kind of weather the storm. So um, when I talked to you before the show, I said, we'll kind of go and look through the end of the year. Yep. But even that is hard to do in these circumstances. Yeah, and that's the thing right now. And I, I just mentioned, you know, being an advisor to um, the customers, you know, they're one thing that I think is the most important thing right now for people to do is to really reach out to those advisors. Um, you know, if you don't have that banking relationship mm -hmm. where you can pick up the phone mm -hmm. and get someone directly to go through what it is, um, there are a lot of great mutual banks out there um, in the area that are looking to give back to the community. Um, Northeastern Savings Bank is one of them. We're, we're looking to make sure that our community members are taken care of and that they have the right path going forward. Um, you know, business owners have enough to do on a day-to-day -day basis right now in terms of putting that together. Um, I think it's important that they have that resource to reach out to, to talk about, okay, if we do this step, what's next? And, you know, what we can do to get to that next level or make sure that they're ready if something else happens down the road mm -hmm. um, and cover themselves for any future events. Um, so I'm going to ask you a couple times in our segment to share your contact information. Can yep. you share that with the viewers? Yep. Um, my name is Brian McCowan, Northeastern Savings Bank. Uh, I, my office is at 2 Pilgrim Hill Road in Plymouth, uh, right off exit 6. And right now, currently working out of the office, I'm sorry, out of home. Um, and my phone number is 508-561-3290. So let's talk about um, if somebody is seeing the show yep. and they have a need um, for a um, potential commercial venture uh, they want to get into. Yep. Um, what kind of things should they do in preparation for meeting you? Yeah, I think the best thing is to have that plan in place. It's you know understanding where where you want to go and having that basic understanding. Um, you know what are you looking to get out of the loan relationship. Um, we like to provide every detail that we can, um, but I think it's important to have that basis in terms of you know, what you're looking for to get out of the loan, whether it's to refinance, to take money out, to do additional improvements to an investment property, um, whether it's to pull money out from a business that you, where you operate out of the building and you're looking to do improvements to the building, or if it's capital that you're looking to build. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having that understanding of what your goal is, and then we can start to piece together what, what would work best for the individual business or um, company in terms of what they're looking to achieve with the loan. And what percentage of the people that are coming to you are existing businesses versus a potential startup? Yeah, so one of the things that, you know, I. I find fun in my job right now is because we haven't had that market uh, in Plymouth for uh, until kind of coming down there to see what we could do about expanding. Um, everyone that I talk to is pretty new to the bank um, and we have several different programs that we can do. So whether you're a startup or you've been in business for a while, we have different programs that we can kind of piece you into mm -hmm. based on where you're looking to go. And I think that's sometimes the the most fun that I have with this job is, you know, sitting down with people and figuring out what their goals are and how we can help them get there. Um, there's nothing more rewarding than start taking a deal from start to finish and seeing the smile on people's faces when they get that sure. financing that they need sure. to take that next step. So I'm sure you guys do a lot of discussions and planning uh, within your organization. Yep, absolutely. When are you looking for it to get back to the old normal, and I'll even say the old normal being February and March, yeah, pre-COVID. I, I would say right now we're, we're back to lending. Um, our doors are open, our, our doors are always available to those that um, are looking for financing. We've started to look at new deals. We're starting to piece everything together at this point. Um, 
now and more important than ever, we're looking for, again, what, what are you looking to do with the funds and what's your true plan going forward? Um, so it's going to be very important that we have that structure in terms of what you did to get from March to now and what you're going to do to get from, you know, August, September through the end of the year and going forward. So it's, it's really determining what your cash flow needs are, how you need to tweak those based on different events that are occurring. And we kind of piece that together with the product that you would best fit you going forward. So it sounds like you'd be encouraging people to look to the future and we will get out of this um, in the near future, hopefully, the yeah. turn of 21. I, I hope we're turn of 21, we're, we're looking better, but I, I think it's very important that people get that three to six month time frame uh, and look at what your cash flow needs are. Mm -hmm. Look at you know, what options are out there and you know, even looking at different trigger points that may affect sales in a given month or you know, may impact that cash flow. And let's figure out how do we fill those gaps that's looking at short term, then let's look out a year and a half from now. Let's look towards January 2022 and do that same kind of analysis in terms of where your cash flow needs are, what you have currently, and what you may need to get through the next year. And it doesn't cost anything to sit down with you. It does not cost anything. Right. No. So can you share your contact information one more time? Yeah, it's Brian McCown with Northeastern Savings Bank. You can reach me at 508. 561-3290. Uh, you can also email me at bmccowan, B-M-C-C-O-W-A-N, at northeastern, E-A-S-T-O-N, savingsbank.com. Well, thanks for coming on. A lot of great information. I thanks. appreciate it, John. Thanks so much. Yeah, great. Welcome back to the Registers Report. Again, my name is John Buckley. I want to thank Brian McCowan for the great job he did describing what is happening in the commercial real estate market and what they've done uh, to deal with the COVID-19 impact. And I thought the PPE loans that they were uh, giving out um, was, was certainly uh, an unusual thing they didn't expect to be dealing with uh, at the beginning of the calendar year. And they've done a great job as a, as a lender to, to meet their responsibilities. Uh, in this segment of the show, it's always something lighter in nature. Some of our Plymouth County in Plymouth Colony history. Uh, the holidays for the month of September, we've gone by Labor Day, uh, we've gone by Patriot Day the 11th, uh, Constitution Day uh, is tomorrow, um, 18th is the start of Rosh Hashanah, uh, the 19th October fest starts, 22nd is the beginning of fall, the autumnal equinox, and the 27th Gold Star Mother Day. So let's take a look at a couple of our notable land records. Um, the Albert Norris Reservation in Norwell is a beautiful piece of property, particularly in the fall as the trees start to change color. The property is a walking place. Uh, it leads uh, from Norwell Center down to the North River it was a gift of land donated by Eleanor Norris to the trustees of reservation in honor of her late husband, Alfred. He was a World War II veteran who served in the Navy, and they met while skating at the former Boston Arena before marrying in 56. Um, there were various parcels of land they cobbled together along the North River where they cut timber cleared brush, and repaired cart paths. She had a love for the science and ecology of that area of Plymouth County. She was a, she was a first grade teacher who taught in Hanson and other towns and involved in the establishment of the South Shore Natural Science Center in Norwell. So Eleanor donated 100 beautiful and tranquil acres to the trustees of reservation. And it's a beautiful place to take a walk, uh, particularly in the fall. So I wanted to bring that out to your attention. Um, as we get closer and closer to a very well-watched, 
presidential election, I want to talk about one of our very famous Plymouth County residents who never made it to be president, Daniel Webster. He was a lawyer, orator, statesman, and senator. Although he was born in New Hampshire and in New Hampshire served as a congressman, he delivered an oration at the bicentennial of the Pilgrim's arrival. This year, we're in the quadricentennial, the 400th anniversary. Uh, but he delivered that uh, message in the 1820 courthouse that hadn't even been completed at the time. Um, he was a very active individual, a leader across the country, um, appointed Secretary of State by President Harrison, and then re-elected to the Senate, and he had a place in Marshfield that many famous uh, treaties and other things were negotiated, and it was one of the largest estates in Marshfield, uh, formerly owned by uh, the Winslow family. Next is another one related to politics, uh, Pope's Tavern. So what is now where Pope's Tavern was located is the Halifax Council on Aging, right on Route 106 in Halifax, across from Town Hall. Thomas Pope was a captain in the Revolutionary War. He kept a tavern directly across the street from the Town Hall and the Congregational Church. Um, it was a place that many people visited, including Daniel Webster, who was a frequent guest. Um, Daniel Webster was known for his love of beer and oysters, and he was known to frequent taverns on his travels. And back in those days, many times, they stayed in a tavern overnight because of how long it took to travel. Um, so in October of 1830, um, so that many years ago, the Republican Congressional Convention was held to nominate uh, their nominee for Congress for that district at the time. And the person was John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams is the only president of the United States that has gone back and served in Congress. Um, Halifax, known as the heart of Plymouth County, has also been the location of many county gatherings. And last but not least, one of our colonial records. Um, this colonial record is kind of unique. We have the colonial records in a temperature controlled uh, reading room and vault at the Registry of Deeds, our records that go back to the 1620s and the handwriting of the colonists, including a lot by William Bradford. This particular document recorded in the colonial records was unique because it was for a piece of property in Leiden, Holland, the last location where the pilgrims lived prior to coming to America. And in this particular document, it identified Mary Smith as the sometimes wife of the late Richard Masterson, deceased, deeding it to her children back in Holland. And sometimes wife really was a way they referred to her husband as having passed away, not that she was an off and on wife, but it certainly catches people's attention when you read the transcription. Um, and basically, um, they decided to consummate that deal so that her children um, would know that she'd given up her possessions back on the other side of the world and that she was making the Plymouth Colony a permanent home. So I want to thank Lorna Green Baker from my office, Christine Richards, helping me put this show together, um, Mike Simmons and Isaac Cabral work with me today in the show. Uh, this is my 119th show uh, I put out doing one a month with the help of Brockton Cable Access Television. And we hope uh, you have a good remaining fall 
and we'll see you next month. Thank you.